be seated. Good morning, First Methodist family. It is a joy to be with all of you today as we're here to worship the Lord. And if you are visiting with us for the very first time today, we want to extend a First Methodist Houston welcome to you. And if you uh, have any questions for us, please do not hesitate. Everybody here is very friendly and we would love to answer those questions. And if you are watching us online today, welcome. I know that we have some people watching us from New York because I talked to them today. And uh, we welcome you all to our services. So right now, we're getting ready to worship the Lord. We're getting our hearts all prepared for beautiful music, a wonderful sermon, a time of prayer. So would you join me right now as we go to the Lord in prayer? God of grace and God of glory, thank you for your presence here with us today. We ask that you would pour out your power on all of your people gathered here and everyone watching us on our website. Dear God, we come here today claiming your amazing love for us and claiming your uniqueness in each person that you have made. We are holding fast Psalm 139 that says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You have given each one of us spiritual gifts to use, to build up and edify the body of Christ. We thank you for giving those gifts to us. And Lord, we ask that we would be reminded today what they are and how we can use them, not only here at First Methodist Houston, but in our city and in the world. Don't let us ever take them for granted but be joyful and offer them back as a sacrifice to you. We love you, Lord, and we are ready to worship you. It's in your name we pray, amen. Would you please stand for our hymn? <laughs>
seated. Well, early this morning, while most of you were asleep, I was up looking over today's service and all of a sudden a couple of texts came in really early. The first one was from a woman from the West Campus who decided she wanted to use her spiritual gifts to visit people in the hospital. And she said, I'm in and use me. Well, I was very excited about that early morning text. And then another one came in. This one is from Pastor Lance. He's at the West Campus today meeting with the Source team, and he sent me this little um, tidbit to read to you all now. So I'm going to be obedient, and I'm going to read it. <laughs> I better, huh? Thank everyone who has made a commitment to our One Together, our 2023 stewardship campaign. So far, $1.77 million has been pledged to general ministries and $254,000 has been pledged to missions. Last year, we received approximately $3 million in tithes and offerings for general ministries and $442,000 in second mile giving for our missions in the annual campaign. That is a tremendous accomplishment. And he writes, thank you. Imagine how much more God can do through every person who calls First Methodist home if they would consider taking a step above and beyond the tithe. We have an opportunity to still do that in our One Together campaign. Now is the perfect time to pray about your financial commitment to our campaign. Commitment cards are available right there as you are exiting today. You can fill it out. You can drop it in the uh, offering plate. You can also do it online. And if you have any questions about any of this, you can contact his secretary, Susie. Now, here's what he wrote at the end. Pastor Lance has set a goal of two million in general ministries and 300,000 in missions. Together, he believes that we can exceed that goal. So he says, let's take a bold step in our faith and let's celebrate what all God is doing in the life of our church. Now, I'm sure he's gonna watch this 11 o'clock service, so did I do okay? Yeah. I'm gonna ask the ushers now to come forward and I want to lift up a prayer for us this morning. Good and gracious God, thank you so much for being our strength and our song. And thank you for all the wonderful delights that you place in our hearts and our lives. Help us today and every day to give our tithes and our offerings joyfully, happily, obediently. And Lord, we ask that whatever is given, that it will be used to continue to make your kingdom shine throughout the world. May the grandeur of Jesus be the light that continues to guide us in all that we do. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
as we confirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand or Mrs. Potato Head. I've got one here. He's kind of seen better days, but let's see how silly we... So, that's pretty crazy, but I don't think that a real body would work very well if it was put together this way. Um, did you know that the Bible calls us Christians the body of Christ? And that means that all of us are supposed to work together to do the work of Jesus. The Bible tells us in Romans 12, 4 through 5, that there are many different parts of the body of Christ, and each one of us has an important job to do. Some of you may become pastors one day. Some of you are great encouragers, while others of you may be really great at praying for people. God has also given you talents such as music, sports, arts, all different things. And every single one of these gifts and talents can help you bring others to Christ. So let's look at our potato head again. Is there any part that he has that's not important or doesn't help him in some way? Not really. He needs his ears to hear, his mouth to eat and talk. He even needs his hat to protect him from sunburn or getting rained on. And it's the same way with us, the body of Christ. We might not all be pastors or we might not all have beautiful singing voices, but we all belong to Christ's body and we each have important work to do.
you may be seated. I think that's a perfect song for where we are. As I was hearing on the news this last week that we are probably finally coming out of this post-COVID back to some new normalcy. And you know, we've been through a year of transitions. There's been a lot that has happened. And in this hymn, we are reminded softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling us, calling us home, calling us to remind us who we are and who we're to be, what we are to be about. We are called to be the church, to be the hands and feet of Christ. And so we are in the midway of this series of looking at what does it mean to be the church? And in that, we are looking at that through the lens of our membership vows. There are prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Today we are looking at gifts, and not so much as the financial gifts as much as our spiritual gifts. The gifts that we have been given by God. Last week we talked about presence, and we were in the story of Acts 2.42, one of my favorite scripture verses that describes the church and what the church is to be about. In, two, in Acts 2, verse 42, it highlights in that one verse how the people come together and do life together. They do worship, they study the Bible together, they pray together, they help one another. When someone is missing on something and they need, they're in need, this other one steps in and helps. When someone is lacking or they are feeling and they're in a struggle, this other person comes alongside. And it is a beautiful capsule of what the church is and is to be about. It's right on the heels and it's right in the big story of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit rushed in and and overwhelmed each of them and filled them with the Holy Spirit. And then they went from that place and they grew the church. They continued to share their stories of transformation and what it meant for Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior and how that was making an impact on their life. As they were sharing those stories, more and more people joined. More and more people experienced the transformation. And one of those people was a, name by the name, a man by the name of Paul who had a significant transition. He went from a persecutor to a believer and so much that he became a leader in one of those faith communities and built up the church in Corinth. And so he goes and he's building this church and it gets to a healthy place that he feels like he can safely, and they're off, they're good, that he can go off and create more churches and get more faith communities up and going. And in that time, he begins to hear correspondence from his home church that they're having some struggles, they're having some disagreements. And so he writes a letter back to them to respond to that. Now, I don't know if this was for you, but maybe you used to call your parents in the afternoon when they were at work and say, Mom, Dad, and you would ask these questions you already knew the answers to. Maybe you said, well, my brother or my sister is bothering me, and it shows a little bit of squabbling. And there's a tone. There's this urgency in the parent's response that you know that they mean business, that that what they are telling you, that you're supposed to remember who you are and what you're supposed to be about. My brother and I experienced that growing up. We were those latchkey kids that would come at home in not really more than an hour or so. But we would come home, we knew that we had snacks, we knew that we were supposed to be about doing the few chores that my mom gave us, uh, doing our homework, and not causing a ruckus. And yet, almost every day, we would call her, yeah, about 4.15. You know, she's in that last hour of crunch time, trying to get things done to get us home. Hey, mom, what can I have for a snack? Hey, mom, can you believe my brother's doing this? Back and forth. Maybe you've experienced that. This is kind of the tone and what Paul's responding to as well. Guys, Remember that you are called to be the church, and this is what you are to be about. But in that response, I think we hear sometimes there's some snarkiness. There's very uh, directed response to things that are particular to their community. I don't know that Paul really intended that it would be canonized to become scripture, but he was giving these specific instructions to this community to say, remember that you are Christ. You belong to Christ, and you're to be rooted in love. This is what it looks like to be about the business of the church. And so he gives lots of instructions, 
But then he gets down to what does it mean to have spiritual gifts? And so this morning, our scripture comes from the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able. If you have your own Bible, I encourage you to open it. We're going, to hit, we're going to hit the bookends of the text because I don't think you want to stand for all 31 verses as we read the whole book. But we'll hear these words. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them and everyone. The teach is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits. To another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated, activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free. And we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Now you are the body of Christ, individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all speak in tongues? Do all work miracles? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you still more an excellent way. The word of God for us, the people of God, thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, you have called us from many walks of life, from many different experiences. As we gather in this time to worship you, remind us that we are yours and that we are your beloved, that your Holy Spirit is in this place, moving us, equipping us to not only be the disciples you have called us to be, but to be the church that you continue to call us to be. Oh God, enable us, encourage us that we are yours, that we are equipped in specific and gifted ways so that we can respond to your call. Oh God, now rescue me from me, hide me in your cross, and I'll be so careful to give you all the praise and glory. In your son's holy name, amen. So I have a confession to make this morning, and it started in the last couple weeks, and I thought, hmm, I wonder if I should ever utter these words, but I think it's valuable with our text this morning, but I will say that I ask one thing of you if I'm going to be so vulnerable to share this confession, uh, that you don't say, oh my goodness, what is wrong with her? And secondly, that you don't say, next time you hear or you hear from me, like I call you or I email you, you say, oh no, and put the phone down, all right? So you can at least just say, I'll try not to do that, all right? Because here's my confession. And some of you are going to be like, are you crazy? And God might have tested it with how many hours some of us were together in the last two weeks. Um, but I love church meetings, Okay. <laughs> And I hear some of the laughter. Some of y'all have been in a few meetings for a few decades. But here's the thing. On Sunday mornings, this is the most of the relationship that we get. And then sometimes on the way out, I get, uh, we talk about football or we talk about the World Series. We talk about different things. We're just a sweet baby in the back that blows wonderful kisses. Uh, but we don't get a whole lot of interaction. But in those church meetings... I get to figure out and get to witness what your gifts are, what your strengths are, the things that make you tick, the things that make you passionate, the things that frustrate you, 
and aggravate you and the things that you're like, oh, this is my hope, this is my dream for our church. This is what I think God is doing in this midst. This is why I've hung on and continued to go through different seasons. And so, yes, I love church meetings. Sometimes we might go a little long, but I, I don't like, Jim, don't worry. I don't like meetings just to be meeting, but I appreciate when we bring our gifts and graces together. It's interesting, we've had this committee that's come to our team that's come together, known as the SMT, the Strategic Mapping Team, which is a big fancy term to say, a group of our entire church that's been selected to really discern what are our gifts, what are our growing edges, and where is God leading us? And in this time of meeting, we discovered last fall, as we look at all aspects of the church, uh, what it costs to host meetings after hours. And so one of the commitments of that committee is to meet in different places. You know, remember the story of Zacchaeus, you know, offer my home and whatnot, and we were invited to offer different gifts and graces. So we've met in the home of one person or one family, and then this, a couple weeks ago, we met in the office of a different church member. I didn't know anything really about this church member. I believe we have almost every kind of attorney in our church that exists. Uh, so I might have assumed that he was just another attorney. Really didn't know what his gifts were. And uh, we went to this office, an incredible room of technology. But throughout the meeting, I kept having my eye on this one picture over here. There are two bridges that are running parallel to each other, and then there are two 18-wheelers. Actually, I would say semi-trucks. There are way more than 18 wheels on both of them. Uh, but these massive trucks, and across both of them in the chasm between is a pipe. And I, I told him afterwards, I said, I want to know more about this. He goes, that's what we do every day. We move stuff. And I said, but this is what the, we're supposed to be about. We're, you know, the God's moving us and we're trying to move the people without getting it all cattywampus and falling apart. This is what we're supposed to be about. But the interesting thing is I didn't know that that's his gift set. That's part of what he does every day is how to mobilize people and mobilize equipment. Likewise, we had another young professional in the meeting who gave us an incredible in-depth explanation of what it looks like to right-size the church. Guys, I spent way too much money on seminary, way too many long classes, way too many 20-page papers, and this young professional in our church did it in seven minutes. And I said, you need to go teach seminary uh, and what it looks like to do church. Uh, but we have all of these gifts and graces. We get into trustees and people bring their legal expertise. Some are urban planners and understand the importance of maximizing how we use our space beyond Sunday mornings. All of that, and then we have times to laugh, we have times to cry. Y'all, you have some incredible, beautiful prayers that I would have never heard had I not been in one of those committee meetings. So yes, I love church meetings because we move beyond this space and really get to be the church. Likewise, the early church in Corinth was very different from one another. They came from all walks, all places of life. As we heard in the scripture, there were those of Jewish background, there were those from other worshiping um, backgrounds that were Greek, there were those who were free, those who were slaved, those who were rich, those who were poor, those who had families, those who were widowed. There's a whole variety of people. And as they came together, they had incredible experiences as we read in Acts, in Acts 2.42, how they came together and they did life. But they often are, were like the people that we call the church. They are a perfect group of imperfect people. And they began to do what people do. They began to kind of look at each other and compare. Compare the kind of gifts, the kind of talents, the kind of skills that they bring to the table. They even went so far as some of them to say, well, if this person does this and this, like specifically in that context, speaking in tongues, does that person have more of the Holy Spirit than this person over here who's just leading a small Bible study or a little covered dish of fellowship? 
they really got to begin like sizing up one another. And then they began to say, well, if this person has more Holy Spirit than this, what does that mean for leadership? And all of a sudden, the one thing that they were supposed to be rooted in, the rooted in love, the one thing that binded them, the worship of God, all of a sudden was becoming secondary or third. And they were letting these other things divide them. Things in themselves that really aren't that trivial, but put together was distracting them from who they were and what they were to be about. So Paul writes this letter and reminds them, reminds them who has the spiritual gifts, where they come from, and how they're to be used. So Paul reminds them that the, the gifts come from God. And everybody has a gift. Every, I shouldn't say a gift, it was very clear. Everybody has either a gift or multiple gifts, but that is up to the Holy Spirit. And as they looked at it, he said, you know, the same grace that enables you to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord is the same grace that enables each and every person to be gifted. Remember a few, well, you go back in your Wesley theology, we look at how grace moves us to that confession. It's not on our own good graces, on our own good will, that we're able to say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. It's by God's grace working in and through us continually, pulling us along, pushing us along, encouraging us to that point that we get to what we call justifying grace. And we say, aha, Jesus Christ, lived, died, and was resurrected for me, for my sins, and we have that aha moment, and we want to make a change in the way we lead, in the way we live our lives. The way that happens is through God's grace, and it's by that same grace that we are enabled with these gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul reminds them that each and every person has those gifts. We don't get to say, oh, I'm not really sure about your gifts or that. No. When we confess together that we believe in Jesus Christ, we are all enabled with those gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he goes on quickly to say where those come from. They are a gift from the Holy Spirit. Spiritual gifts are not merit badges. If you don't get a badge or a gift every time you've gone to so many Sunday school classes or so many covered dishes or so many committee meetings, it's not about that. The spiritual gifts are purely that. They are gifts. They are given to us by God. Nothing that we could earn or deserve those gifts. Simply a gift from God. And why one person might have multiple gifts and one might only see one or two, that's God's holy mystery. And that's not really what we're to be about. But each of us have these gifts, and we're to remember that they are gifts. And then the third piece is that we're to put them to work for God's glory, that we would build up one another. We're to use those gifts not to compete, but to have a symphony, if you will. It's not about, oh, I have this, and maybe you should grow in this skill a little bit, or I have that gift, and this person needs to come along. But we're to take these gifts and have a symphony, if you will, to build up God's church. If you think about in a symphony, if you have a noisy gong or a cymbal over here that drowns out everything else, we miss out on the fullness of what was intended for the experience. Likewise, if someone is playing a violin, but they are playing so quietly, so softly, that it can't be heard, then we miss out on the fullness of what we are to hear and experience. Now, someone might be playing softly because someone told them that they didn't have gifts or someone undermined them. It might be that they just never thought that much of themselves. Somehow they thought, oh, okay, everyone else has gifts, but not me. Whatever it is, we are called to play into that to our fullest. We are to utilize our gifts to the fullest. And all of those gifts come together to be and do the work of the church. Now, the piece that we moved over in the book talks about this very detailed illustration where Paul says each and every 
by e each and every member of the church is vital, is important, plays a key role. That the ear cannot tell the hand that they're not important. That the elbow can't tell the foot. And it goes through all of those stories. And maybe you remember hearing that, we're like, yeah, that's important. But it is very important that each person plays a vital role in being the church that we're called to be. When I heard that I was preaching this text, I'm always reminded of my papa. Now, I'm going to try and tell you this in the least uh, graphic way, but it is something that always stands out to me about this story. When I was young, I think I was in fourth grade, we were at my grandparents, my cousins and I were playing with Legos and in shag carpet, let me tell you. Uh, so we we're playing and all this, we we're playing with these Legos. Granny was, and Nanny was making breakfast, Papa was out mowing. So we're taking care of all this. And all of a sudden we heard a different noise and Papa came in and said, I need help. And we're like, and we were told very firmly to move our Legos. And that's why the shack carpet's important because trying to hurry up and gather Legos out of the way of people rushing back and forth um, is not the easiest task. Long story short, he had had an accident with the lawnmower. We got to the hospital a couple, by a couple weeks later, he only had eight and a half toes. Here's the thing. You know how many people told us it's just the toes? It's okay. Never mind the pain and all that. Everyone kept saying, it's just the toes. It could have been worse. It could have been this. I will tell you, I learned from his rehabilitation, every one of those was important for his balance, for understanding direction and how he was walking. But I was amazed at how many people said, oh, it's just a couple little toes. Nope, every one of them matters. A number of years later, he would then face a 13-year battle with Parkinson's. Every one of those would have made a difference in his walking skills. So we are to remember that even though we can't see what the gifts and the skills that every person brings, it's important to remember that everybody matters. Every person plays a vital role. And as a church, we're called to step up and use our gifts. We're called to step up and encourage someone. If we find that someone hasn't gotten connected in a small group, if we find that someone has some incredible gifts and graces, but they haven't been brought into not only leadership, but Bible studies and other service opportunities, it's our, it's our obligation to step in and say, hey, I see that you have these gifts and graces. You know, come and join us. Come and be a part of that because every member matters. Now it's important to also understand that the Holy Spirit continues to work in and through us. So for some of you, I'm gonna tell you this, and you might say, Mandy, you're stepping on my toes. Because the Holy Spirit is continuously moving, we are expected and called to continuously use our gifts. We don't really get to say, ah, I'm retired. Ah, I'm taking a season off because the Holy Spirit doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit continues to move in and through us, continues to call us and shape us to be the church that God is calling us to be, continues to call us to share God's love and grace, to go out and be the hands and the feet. As we come together and we do this work and we remember, I would encourage you to go back and on verse two, you know, people say, well, what is it my gift? And the litmus test was, does it reflect your profession that Jesus Christ is Lord? So if you think about your gifts and your talents and you think about what could I be doing? I want you to think about how it shows up. How, what are the things that you do to share your love and your faith in Christ? Some of you are really good at calling people and saying, you know what, we've missed you. I want you to come back. That's a role of encouraging. That's an important gift. And if you have that gift, I would encourage you to contact Anne because she will get you connected. There are others who have incredible gifts of vision and uh, sharing and serving. But each of us have incredible gifts for we are wonderfully and fearfully made in the image of God. God calls us his beloved and God calls us to walk alongside him 
and be co-laborers with him in doing the kingdom work that is before us. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we give thanks that you have called us and equipped us to be your disciples and to be your church. Oh God, there are some of us who know what our gifts are. Continue to encourage us to use those for your glory and for your kingdom. But God, there are those of us, those gifts have been a little hidden or a little dusty. We ask that you enable us to be so bold and courageous to lean into those gifts to serve you for the benefit of your church. For those of us who are curious and wonder what in the world you're doing in and through us and what our gifts may be, enable us to ask those questions. Enable us to open our eyes and our hearts to see how you are stirring and equipping us to be the disciples and then to be the church that you are calling us to be. But God, as we go out today, enable us, equip us to share in the good news. We pray this in the name of your son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, I invite you, as always, to come during our closing hymn. If you are wanting to spend time in prayer and seek and ask God, what are my gifts? Or help me to dust those off and use them. We invite you to come in a time of prayer. If you're looking for a church where you could use those gifts, we also encourage you to come talk to Ann and I. We would love to have a conversation with you about that. This morning in our closing hymn, it's going to be to a familiar tune. That's fine. All right, Christ from whom all blessings flow. It's a wonderful Charles Wesley hymn, but as we sing it, you're going to recognize the tune of Jesus Loves Me. So you should be able to pick out that tune. It's a great Sunday to look at it on the, on the screen versus in your hymnal so you can hear the tune. And I invite you to sing those words as we remember who we are to be, who we are to be about and what we are to be about. Let us stand as we are able.
strategic mapping process, I encourage you to look at your newsletter because part of that is a youth and family assessment that is happening next weekend. There are different ways that everyone can be a part of that. You might say, my kids are long grown. Guess what? You are still a part of the body of the church. In our baptismal vows, we are all a part of raising them up. So there is a piece for you to participate. So I encourage you to look at your newsletter for next week on when the time and place is that you can participate in that. As we go forth this morning, friends, you are God's beloved. You are God's gifted and holy ones called to go forth and share the good news. So go forth and be the church. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.